God is like uh, an intimate logistics officer. <laughs> what is that about? You know, I struggled um, not with the concept for this week, but what to call it, because it's hard to come up with a one-word metaphor that people understand. And I've talked with a lot of people this week about things, and that was the best I could do. So let it go. Just let it go. Last week we said God is like a, a homegrown peach, delicious, juicy. The thing that I'm concerned about is that we think God is like he's been described for probably most of our lives. Uh, a little bit upset, kind of cranky, um, white, male, bearded, uh, flowing robes, pointing finger, not, not even close, right? In fact, it's funny, even the, the paintings that we have, not, not even so much of God, although God certainly, but uh, even of Jesus, you know, those paintings we have, it's so funny, right? You know, Jesus, Jesus wasn't a long-haired white guy. You know that, right? <laughs> now, when Michelangelo and others painted him in the 12th century, uh, all men had this great long hair, and so they just assumed men always had. And Jesus wasn't an American, not even an Italian. He was Palestinian, olive-skinned, hair usually a little short, uh, beard, scruffy, body odor, dirty clothes, dirt under fingernails, okay, right? Real, real. Um, and, and so what I want to do for today and the next few weeks, and by the way, next week is going to be a fun week. Um, we're going to set up this room completely differently because the title is God is like a kindergarten teacher. You will enjoy it, I promise. Before we go any further, I want to pray. And actually, um, that brings up uh, one, a woman that I think a lot of us know who is failing in health, uh, Isabel Domins, who was a kindergarten teacher. Uh, Isabel is not doing well, so I want to pray for her. Uh, and I also want to pray um, for someone who's very special uh, to a, a quester. Um, remind me, Tiana, who's going to be having a double mastectomy this week. So let's pray for her as well. So, God, I want to bring Isabel before you and ask that you would help her know how deeply she's loved. And I pray, too, God, for Tiana, that you would strengthen her through this surgery that will save her life. Uh, I pray that you would, you would help her heart bring people around her who can care for her. I'm, I'm glad, God, that this is even possible. We come to you, Father, with a great hope that you are good. And there is something deep inside of us that knows it's true. But there's also a part of us that needs a deep reassurance that it's true. And so help us with that today, God. Amen. A logistics officer is someone who makes sure that whatever is necessary to do whatever that has to be done is provided. Um, both human resources, and any other kind of resource. Finances, equipment, tools. Someone who is a logistics uh, mastermind makes sure that those who are, that the job that has to be done has everything it needs brought to bear. Now, I am not that person. Are you? I don't know. How do you do when you have a big project at home and, you know, you kind of spend all week getting things? This week I had this amazing opportunity on Friday. Friday, most, most Fridays are my day off. And so on Friday, I had this great plan to change the oil in my wife's car, uh, which is quite a process in this car, and also to change a water pump on said car. And I had done a great job of ordering the water pump ahead of time, and it came in the mail, and there it was with all the gaskets and everything I needed. And this is kind of fun for me, by the way. And so I got up real early um, and brought the, the car down to my garage and, um, to do the work and I had a, a meeting with someone that I wanted to go in another car. So I brought the other car up. We took a nice ride. And then I went back down to the garage to do the work and realized that I had forgot the key to my wife's car at home. So um, 
I, I said nasty things about myself. Dope. And drove home to get the key. And I got the key and came back to my garage. I have a, a friend and I have a garage in Belmarin Keys with a car lift and yeah, it's wonderful. It's like, and you're not, I'm not telling you where it is. <laughs> it's an undisclosed location, but it's just like this great spot, right? So I get back down there with the key and I pull the car in and I put it up on the lift and I didn't have the right Allen wrench to take the oil drain plug out. It was at home. See, this is the problem with having two garages. So I went the whole way home, got the right Allen wrench, and went the whole way back down to the garage again, frustrated with myself, and got the Allen wrench, a big Allen wrench, and took out this huge plug and realized I had just removed the plug for the transmission fluid. <laughs> and I knew that because red liquid began pouring everywhere. So I quickly put that back in and realized, actually, I had the right Allen wrench after all. It was. So uh, I went home and did something else. And on Saturday afternoon, I changed the oil in my wife's car and haven't yet changed the water pump. Because I'm not very good with logistics. <laughs> logistics and making sure that you have the right resources brought to bear at the right time is a skill and uh, a gift. It takes a certain mindset. and. Um, not only a certain kind of thinking, but it takes a group of people who are convinced that that's really important. I, as I have begun to understand more about God, I've realized that's one of the, the, the kind of parts of God that is remarkable. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the fact that what God does is he kind of looks at the earth and he sees, okay, going to need a little bit of this over here. It's going to take this much money and this many people. And then he goes about making sure that all of those things are in the right place at the right time. And where you come in is really important. Now, there's a lot of different ways of looking at this. But I, I want us to look at, first of all, the fact that God, as a logistics officer, does a remarkable job as an outrider. Hi, Bob and Jackie. I'm glad, oh, so glad you guys are here. It's a treat to see you. No heckling this week, please. <laughs> the, the word outrider, does that mean anything to you? I love that term. Growing up, I always loved the outriders. And the outrider is kind of the scout of the party. They go ahead and make sure everything is OK. And they, they find out where this is and where that is, and they come back and report. The word outrider is this beautiful term for someone who is intimately concerned with this group but goes ahead because they know the territory to make sure what needs to happen. God is that kind of a, 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 has that kind of a role. God is not an insider. When you think about insiders, you know, we've, we've heard a lot about that here lately, but God is not kind of a, a part of the bureaucracy that, that kind of is causing the difficulties in our world. God is an outrider. He's an outsider. In fact, listen to this passage that the Apostle Paul writes in the book of Hebrews, talking specifically about Jesus. He says this, so let's go outside. And, you know, I guess I could change a slide now and then. That's kind of my idea of an outrider. Paul writes this, so let's go outside where Jesus is, where the action is, not trying to be privileged insiders, but taking our share in the abuse of Jesus. This insider world is not our home. We have our eyes peeled for the city that's about to come. God is not an insider. He hangs out with the last, the lost, and the least. The people that no one else really wants to hang out with. That's where you'll find him. It's not, no mistake that that's who Jesus hung out with. Now, I've got several examples, and we're going to do kind of a lot of surveying of some verses in the scriptures, but one of my favorite examples of this, and if you've been here, you've probably heard me talk about this woman, this woman named Hagar. Remember her? Hagar was a slave, and she was uh, a hand attendant, 
to a very famous woman in the First Testament named Sarah. Sarah was wife of one of the most famous guys in the Old Testament named Abraham. Abraham and Sarah were married, and they couldn't have children. There was a medical issue, and they couldn't have kids of their own. So in that time period, in the tradition, in that uh, economy of, uh, of sociology, what you would do as a family is you would have uh, a surrogate. And of course, there was no such thing as artificial insemination. And so you would, as a man, take one of your wife's servants and have a child with her. And that's how you would continue your line. We're in a tribal culture where, uh, number one, you wanted to have a lot of children, and number two, you wanted most of those children to be what? Male. Right. That's the culture they lived in. If you had a, 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 a female, that female, would, chances are, would go and move out of your tribe to be part of another tribe, because all of your males are related. So Abraham uh, was this man that couldn't have uh, children with his wife Sarah, so he, Sarah said, so take Hagar, my handmaid, and have a child with her. And they did. The child's name was Ishmael. Ishmael. Now, about 15 years pass, and guess who gets pregnant? Sarah. Says, my God, Abraham, I'm pregnant. And they have a child. The child is another male. His name is Isaac. Now, Sarah has been putting up with Hagar and Ishmael for 15 years. And Hagar has not made it easy on Sarah. Hagar has said things like, um, well, I don't even know what, I don't even want to go there. But she has made Sarah fear very jealous of the fact that she could have a son and Sarah couldn't. So now Sarah is pregnant. She has this son named Isaac. And she looks at Hagar, her handmaid, and says, get out. Now, that doesn't mean take your stuff and go to the bus station. Right? We're talking middle of the desert, middle of nowhere. When you say get out, it means go die in the desert. So that's where we find Hagar. In Genesis chapter 16. Listen to this. When she, uh, so, so Sarah said to Abraham, you're responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she has a son, she despises me. Abraham says, your servant's in your hands. Do with her whatever you think best. Sarah mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that was beside the road to Shur, and he said, listen to this question. I think this is the single best question in the Bible. Love it. Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from, and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, she answered. And the conversation goes on. You should read that story later today. Where have you come from, and where are you going? Now, God finds her in the middle of nowhere and asks that question. Where have you come from, where are you going? Why does he ask that question? Because he wants to know what she needs He's a logistics manager. Hagar, son of Sarah, a uh, servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? Now, interestingly, God knows the answer. And interestingly, more interestingly, Hagar only answers half the question, right? Well, I've come from Sarah, but um, didn't have a real plan. <laughs> what God always does is he finds people in the middle of nowhere, wherever they are. Now, that middle of nowhere may be in a hotel room all by themselves. It may be sitting at their kitchen table, kind of feeling, with a feeling of despondency and lostness. It may be somebody sitting in their car in the middle of a parking lot, wondering what they're going to do next. It may be a single mom just realizing she's pregnant again. It may be a, a, a man on his commute home from work wondering, where the heck did my life go? But wherever that is... That is exactly where Yahweh finds us. Because he doesn't hang out with just the people who have got it all together and everything is good and we're kind of... He hangs out with people who are on the outside, like me. Uh, the misery of Israel. In, in the book of Exodus, chapter 3, Moses is hanging out in the middle of nowhere with his father-in-law, working for 40 years, shepherding his father-in-law's sheep, one day he comes across this bush, which is what? 
Yeah, it's on fire. Moses steps aside to see this amazing thing, and a voice comes out of the bush. Moses, take off your shoes, because where you're standing is holy ground. I want you to go and let Israel free. Moses says, forget it. God says this in, in um, Genesis chapter 3. I can't find them. Where do I, know? I don't know what I did with my notes all of a sudden. They're in here somewhere. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, I think verse 17, God says, I have heard the cry. Here they are. I have heard the cry from my people, Israel, and I am sending you to deliver them. See, I have heard the distress. Now, here's the problem. Israel was sending out the distress signal for 400 years. See, that's where we have an issue, <laughs> right? Does it feel like that sometimes? Psalm 40, I waited and waited and waited on God. Finally, he heard my distress call. He lifted me out of the miry pit and he put my feet upon a rock. But there is a lot of waiting when it comes to God. And I think that there's a lot of waiting for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is this one, and it's a nuanced reason that I want to get at. Moses was born in Pharaoh's uh, palace. Remember the story, right? Found him in, a, in the river, Moses, uh, Pharaoh's daughter. It's a pretty famous story. Was raised for 40 years in the palace of Pharaoh, and then he realized, wait a second, I'm not Egyptian, I'm Hebrew. And these Hebrews, these slaves that I'm supervising, they're my people. And so Moses gets very upset, and he kills an Egyptian who's mistreating a Hebrew slave, and he gets found out, and his life is worthless now. Pharaoh never really liked him anyway, I don't think. So Moses flees into the desert. Now he's 41, 42, 43, 44, 45. He's 80 when he sees the burning bush. And you know what Moses is saying? I had one shot, and I blew it. That's what our culture says. Our culture says that so many times. You had your shot and you blew it. Now forget about it. It's over. It's somebody else's turn. That is not the way God operates. As this logistics officer, this is what God is doing. He's hearing this cry from Israel saying, get us out of here. And he figures out, you know what? This guy Moses could do it. But Moses blows it when he's 40. And it takes him 40 years to get over it. Now, how many children were born and died as slaves in Egypt during those 40 years? I don't know. But, I mean, my mind just goes. Whew. And then Moses comes to this burning bush, and God says, okay, are you ready? This is really what God says. Are you ready to do this my way now? And Moses says, no, I don't want any part of it. And God finally convinces him and says, okay, I'll go. By the way, in this story, we learn the name of God, right? See, that's why this logistics piece is so important. This is how we know, learn God's name. We didn't know it up until now. Moses says this, of course, right? Like, a, you know, Moses is from New Jersey. So as a good guy from New Jersey says, okay, I'll go, but who should I say sent me? <laughs> and God says, send them, tell them I am. Yahweh, Yahweh. Yod, hey, vav, hey. A name that is not a name. The eternal, self-preserving, present tense one. I am not in the past. I am not in the future. I am always in the present. The present is always with me. That's my name. Tell them that. And Moses said, okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks anyway. <laughs> God, as a logistics officer, is constantly on the lookout for people who are on the outside, on the outskirts. He's the guy that rides on the outside of town. We could go on and on and on with a million illustrations. What, what God does is he finds out where the need is. And you may be saying, well, I've been telling God about this need I've got for so long, and I haven't heard anything yet. Let me just say this. He hears you. She hears you. She knows exactly what you need. And it won't come too late. Although it feels like it does. Isn't 
isn't it nice when you ring the bell to have a servant come? Does that happen in your house? That was one of my favorite parts of Downton Abbey. Remember that show? The little bell down the servants' quarters would ring, and it would tell you who was ringing it and where they were coming from. I'm just so glad I wasn't like a, a, an 18th century servant in England because I would have walked up the steps and said, okay, I heard you the first time. What's, what is your problem? It's like we keep ringing the bell, thinking God doesn't hear the bell. It's not that he doesn't hear it. And if you trust that God is good, you have to understand that the timing on this thing is just as important as the need being met. So God is an outrider. But, see, the great thing about it is he's not just the one who kind of surveys needs and goes, okay, you need this and you need this and I get it and, boy, right now I could sure use some help in North Carolina, right? Right now things in Tulsa are a little crazy. Right now there's really a problem going on in Syria. God's got all these needs and he's kind of created this spreadsheet, right? Man, things in the Middle East are not good, and there's a lot of stuff going on in Libya and Egypt, and, you know, right now, in the middle of, who, who knows where, in the middle of Novato, there's a call going out from someone who is in deep distress, and God hears that, that cry is in his ears, and this is what he does with it. Let me just tell you, first of all, what he doesn't do with it. What he doesn't do with it is swoop in as a superman with God dust and sprinkle it on the situation to make it better. God does not have hands, God does not have feet, God does not have a body. God does not have a single penny. He doesn't have a gallon of water. God doesn't have a bulletproof vest. God doesn't have any resources at all. This is what God is good at. Seeing the need, and then number two, God is a recruiter. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. A long time ago, in the middle of nowhere, a, a town called Ur. Imagine. Where are you from? Where are you from, cowboy? Ur. I don't know. The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to a land I will show you. God's a recruiter. Now, he doesn't say to most people, okay, here's the cost-benefit analysis. You do what I ask you to do and take care of this thing, and I will make your life happy. He says to Abraham, I want you to get up, leave everything you know, and go to a land that I will show you in the future. Now, that conversation between Abram and Sarah must have been remarkable. Right? Think about it. Abraham comes home. Sarah, we're moving. Oh, okay, where are we going? Other side of town? No. I don't know where we're moving. What do you mean you don't know where we're moving? Well, I just had this vision from God. What God? See, there is no, there is no God-human contact really up until now. Abraham didn't have a belief system. He didn't have a doctrinal statement. Abraham didn't even have a name for this religion or this God. Abraham didn't know what was happening or who he was getting this impulse from. He just knew that something, something was making him want to leave where he lived to go someplace else. Why? Because God needed what Abraham had someplace else. See, that's where God gets resources. That's where God gets resources. Remember that old song, if you grew up in the, as a Christian, you know, in the, in the church... God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. He owns the rivers and the rocks and rills. And I always wondered what a rill was. The sun and stars that shine. But he doesn't. Now, I suppose in the big sense he does. But let me just tell you that if you go try to extract gold from some mine in Utah later today... You'll be arrested, and when you're brought before the judge, and you say, well, that was God's gold, they'll still lock you up. In essence, the only resources God has at his disposal right now in this place are the resources that we brought in with us. Human resources, talents, 
gifts, money, ideas, human capital. And so when God sees, well, this is God, we got big problems in North Carolina, he doesn't, listen, he doesn't, never has, and never will just fix it. He always will call people who have solutions to go aid and bring what they have to the table. Do you understand that? That's what God does. He's a recruiter. Now, here's the issue. We're not listening. <laughs> Exodus chapter 3, we already read the story. God says, okay, Moses, I've got a job for you. See, that's it. That's the logistics piece. These people are enslaved. You are a leader who can go get them, and now you realize you can't do it without me, so I'm calling you to do it. Will you do it? Moses says, no, but God finally convinces him. I'm, I'm convinced that every resource that our world needs, whether it's peace or water or food or racial harmony, is available at the disposal of every human being that is on the earth. And God is calling us to bring our gifts to the table to repair, to fix, and to heal. And we're saying, oh, you know what, I'm a little busy right now. I love the Nehemiah story. It's because it's not very well known, but it's one of my favorites. Nehemiah was a guy that lived a little bit later in the history of the Bible. Let me just tell you his story briefly. And uh, Nehemiah was actually captured uh, by a Babylonian army. He was a teenager in Israel. He was captured uh, as a teenager and brought back to Babylon. And as a slave, really, he was compelled to be the cupbearer of King Artaxerxes. He was the guy that tried the king's food to make sure it wasn't poison. What a great job, right? Now, you have to understand, not a really good job, but not a lot got through, and it was an unbelievably trusted position, obviously. Nehemiah was like a right-hand man to the king. And so one day, some people from the Palestinian area came into the courtroom, and, and Nehemiah said, hey, tell me, how are things in Israel? I, I really miss home. Remember those... Remember that? You I mean you just think about home and you go, I wonder how things are back there. And they said, not good. There's poverty. The wall is broken down. There's people are dying of starvation. They are vulnerable to uh, all kinds of attack. It's an awful situation. And Nehemiah gets this feeling in the pit of his stomach. Now, you want to talk about a logistics officer, Nehemiah was awesome. He gets this feeling in the pit of his stomach, and he prays, and it's as if God says to him, okay, there's a problem, and I need you to go fix it. Now, here's the issue. Nehemiah is second in command, second in command to the king, and the king trusts him very much, and Nehemiah thinks that if he tells the king he wants to go back. Now, Israel was a, an enemy. Remember, Babylon sacked Israel. That's where they got Nehemiah and others. So Nehemiah is saying, I want to go back and rebuild the wall in, in Jerusalem. And if he says that to the king, the king's going to say, what are you, some kind of a traitor? And then, Ugh. so Nehemiah prays and fasts. And then the king says to him, why do you look so down, Nehemiah? And Nehemiah says this, and one of the great verses of the Bible says this, so I prayed to my God and I said to the king, and he gives him his answer, I just love that balance. It's not like, God, fix this. And it's not like, okay, I got to talk my way out of this one. It's, I prayed to my God, and I said to the king, O king, live forever. But you would be down too if the, the, the people of your childhood were dead and disparaged. And, and guess what the king does? He says, okay, Nehemiah, you can go back and do whatever you need to do. And here's, here's a letter for the king's forest keeper. He'll give you all the wood you need. And gave him all of the resources he needed. Why? Because, gosh, this is the crux of it, friends. There is this huge need in the middle of nowhere, podunk Israel. And there is one man that God gets his hold of his heart and says, you can do it. And then he prays and God says, here's all the resources you need. All I want for you to do is say yes to me. If you say yes to me, you won't believe what will happen. Nehemiah goes back and the wall is rebuilt. Read that book in the Old Testament. It will blow your mind. There's trash talking in that book. It's the best. <laughs> Tobiah, the Ammonite. You know the Ammonites. Oh. 
Tobiah the Ammonite comes up when they're building the wall. And he's one of the guys that have been raiding Jerusalem. Now they're rebuilding the wall, so there's going to be no more raiding, right? Tobiah the Ammonite comes up. He goes, oh, nice wall, Nehemiah. This is like 5th century B.C. Uh, trash talk. I bet if a fox jumped up on this wall, the whole thing would fall down. Hey, eh, fellas? Ah. It's amazing. And they say, come on, Nehemiah, come over here. Have a palaver with us. We just want to talk. And Nehemiah says, dude, I don't want to have anything to do with you. I'm here on a mission, and I'm going to get this job done. And he was clear-headed and single-minded, and he got it done. This is how the world works, friends, because God is like an intimate logistics officer. He hears what someone needs. He knows who has the need, and then he attempts to connect them. The only ones that can break it down are us. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, and I could go on and on. I could, I really could. I could talk about this forever. In fact, no. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, God is talking amongst himself. <laughs> That'll blow your mind. About something that needs to be done. And Isaiah, this prophet, has kind of got this vision of God's throne room somehow. And God says, who shall we send? Who will go for us? In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, he says, here am I. Send me. I'll go. I'm in. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30. God says, I looked for a person to stand in the gap and to build the wall, but I could not find even one. That's got to be frustrating as a logistics officer, right? To know there's this need and to know what has to happen and to make the call for several people. How does God make the call, by the way? You are not going to get a dream in the middle of the night. Chances are. If you do, you're like, wow, that's awesome. I'm, right? God can do anything he wants. But here's how it's going to happen. You're going to get this. You're going to be watching a TV show or listening to someone's story, and something in your gut is going to go, huh? And it happens to me all the time here when I'll say something like, somebody needs this. Remember, simple things. There are lots of people at the Quest that can't afford the school back-to-school backpacks. To, to get their kids ready for school and you stepped up and, and a lot of you just put some money in a plate because you had the resources and God let us know who needed the resources, right? That's how this works on a very small scale. But it's not small if you're a first grade little girl who doesn't have a pretty backpack like all the other little girls. It's not small to her, small to us. You know, 50 bucks will make a huge difference. But in these bigger problems, it works the very same way. Where God's saying, this is what I need. And when you're watching the TV or you're listening to someone and something in your stomach goes, Bruh! that's God saying, dude, you know you can help with that. God is a recruiter. God is also an activator, and I, I need to move along here. An activator. I, I, I love the idea of activator. Uh, that was my recruiter slide. There's the, that's the last slide I should have had, and this is the one that we're talking about now. See, I'm a logistics mastermind. God is an activator. What does that mean? Uh, God is a catalyst. God is one who not only kind of hears what's happening as an outlier and looks at the resource and begins to kind of assign people responsibilities but then what he does in an amazing way is he then empowers people who say yes to those responsibilities in other words you are able to do things you never thought you could do when you sim simply say yes I'll do it like Moses it's a great example Moses was charged with going back to do something he failed to do the first time but he needed God's activation he tried to do it on his own the first time have you ever tried to do anything on your own Right? That's the stupidest question. So how do we get God's activation? Well, there's, again, story after story after story. David, in Psalm 51, remember we just talked about David for the last several weeks. After David had his affair with Bathsheba and was found out, and the child of that relationship died, David was crushed, and, 
And Psalm number 51 is a prayer that David prays. And part of his prayer is this. God, please do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. What is that Holy Spirit? Well, some churches talk more about the Holy Spirit than others. When I was growing up, it was the Holy Ghost. And it was a little scary. I kept picturing Casper with a, with a God robe on. That's not the idea. The idea is, this is the part of God that resides in a human being. The part of God that is God, that empowers you to do things, say things, be things that you couldn't be without. It's like, it's like you're a lamp. Think of yourself as a lamp for just a second. I'm a lamp. Got a great bulb, nice shade, beautiful lamp, but you're not plugged in. And then you plug it in, and you turn on the switch, and darkness is dispelled. That's what God does inside of a human. It's an, he's an activator. Mark chapter 4, or Mark chapter 1 the Holy Spirit was the animator of Jesus. And we can't take the time to read all of these passages, but they're in your notes. You can look them up later. And by the way, if you're in a small group, you'll be going over this this week in a community group. Um, Mark chapter 1, verse 20, Mark writes, uh, when they had gone a little further, or, uh, pardon me, that's not the right one. Luke chapter 1, sorry. Luke says this, Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted. What, what was the activator in Jesus' life? It was the Holy Spirit. What's the activator in your life? It's the Holy Spirit. How do you get that activation to happen? We're going to talk about that in just a second. Peter's sermon, Peter was a real goofball. He was kind of a loudmouth type A. He wanted to get this whole Jesus business started. He got angry at Jesus when Jesus wasn't following the business plan. And then when Jesus needed him most, right, and the night he was killed, Peter went, yeah, I'm out on this. Don't know who you're talking about. But then later, in the book of Acts, Peter gets up to speak, and you think, oh, no. The last thing we need is Peter to start being the spokesman again for this group. But in Acts chapter 4, verse 8, the scripture says, Peter stood up, and Peter, comma, see, that's what we need. We all need a comma. And Joe Everly, comma, and Peter, comma, full of the Holy Spirit, spoke. And when he spoke, people heard from God. We need to be activated. We can't just come up with a plan and then push it, push it, push it, and then blame it on God if it doesn't work. See, that's the difference. And for the first half of my life, that's what I did. Okay, God, here's my plan. I'm going to go here and do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to plant this church in Nevada, and it's going to be great, and I'm going to build this great church, and it's going to be awesome. And then God took seven years to just beat me into pulp, and I said, God, I don't know if I really want to do this anymore. And he said, good, finally, you're ready. That's the way it works. God does not want to be involved in your plans. Invite him into your plans and see what happens. It's like trying to get a teenager to go to the, out to dinner with you and your husband. Yeah, no, I don't think so, Mom, Dad. God's like, no, I don't want to be involved in your plans. You want to join me in my plans? Door is wide open. But... Dude, your plans are way too small for me. Your ideas are a Lilliputian compared to the ideas that God has. And so God won't join you in your plans. It's the other way around. He's inviting you to join him in his plans. Because he's the outrider who sees and hears. He's the recruiter who's inviting you in. He's the activator that gives you what you need to get the job done. It's interesting, in Acts chapter 6, and I'm just, I'll, I'll be finished up here with this piece, but... The book of Acts is just a little book about the history of the church. And in Acts chapter 6, the church was finally getting around to taking care of people who didn't have enough money. Listen to this. Um, in those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebrew Jews 
Isn't that funny? Because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12, the 12 apostles, gathered all the disciples together and said, you know what, that's not our job. We can't take care of this food issue. So choose seven people from you who are known to you, known to be filled with the Spirit and filled with wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them. We'll let them do that job, and we'll do our job. What was required to be the person who distributed food to widows and orphans? What was the same thing that was required for Peter to stand up and give this great sermon? It had to be full of God. Why? Because feeding people is just as important as giving sermons. And it takes someone who's full of God to know. You know, if you've helped people, you know very well that there's lots of stories. Some of them aren't true. And sometimes when you let God take the lead, you have this sense, you know what, I'm not sure this is really true. And you do end up helping one and not helping another. And it's important. God is an activator, friends. Now, let me finish with this. The thing I love about all of this is this. I know a lot of people. I'm 53. I know a lot of 50-something-year-old men. And one thing is common to a lot of them. They're bored. They're bored. What do you mean they're bored? How could you be bored living in Marin, right? Now, Angola, Indiana, where 25 miles in any direction you have corn. But here, you go to, you know, you could be in Bolinas in 45 minutes. You can be in Tahoe in, what, four hours. You could be in a, one of the greatest cities in the world in half of an hour, 40 minutes. How can you be bored? Well, I get up in the morning and I go to work and uh, I'm bored on my commute and I don't even know why I'm doing this job and about every dollar I have goes to pay the bills and the kids are kind of the kids and I'm married to this person that I love but it's not very exciting anymore and quite frankly, life is boring. Or I'm alone and I'm bored and I want what I don't have and if I get it, I think the problem is I'm going to want something else that I don't have. Why? Because I'm bored. Well, here's the amazing thing that happens when a human being, people like me and you, just regular people, step up to the plate and say, God, if this is true, that you're an outlier and you get what people need, and you're a recruiter, I want you to hear me say, I'm in. When you do that, everything changes. You know, the world of the Bible was a man-central world, right? We've talked about this. There was a time period where women were not, um, we weren't interested in what they could bring to the table, unfortunately. It was a very dark period of humanity. But there are these bright spots even in the Bible. And there is this book in the Bible in the Older Testament called Esther. Now, you have to understand that to name a Bible book after a woman was scandalous. And it actually, to a degree, shows kind of how progressive even that book is to some degree. This, this, this Bible book called Esther is about this woman who was a Jewess. And she was living in uh, uh, a, a town where the person who was second in command to the king hated Jews and was going to commit genocide, kill them all. This is like a common occurring theme in world history, right? It's unbelievable. And Esther is picked to be the wife of the, of the king. She's a Jewess. Her uncle, Mordecai, comes up to her and says to her, listen, you've got to talk to the king because this guy is trying to kill all of us and the king doesn't understand it. And Esther says, I can't talk to the king. He may kill me. In Esther chapter 4, verse 14, Mordecai sent her this message. Don't think that just because you live in the king's house, you're the one Jew who'll get out of this alive. If you persist in staying silent at a time like this, help and deliverance will arrive for the Jews from someplace else, but you and your family will not be used. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe you were made queen for just a time as this. I got to tell you that the day before, Esther's life was boring. Now, she had all the clothes she wanted, 
and all the shoes she wanted. She had anything she wanted except autonomy from the king. But once she got this message from Uncle Mordecai, and she saw herself as someone who could be used by God to save something that needed to be saved, her life became very exciting. In fact, any adrenaline junkies in here? If you want a shot of adrenaline, say to God, okay, God, I'm in. Just let me know what you need. And then when you get that, follow through. And when you're handing someone something that they need and they look you in the eye and you know that all of this was happening because of God, you will feel more adrenaline than you've ever felt. That's what makes life worth living because this is what life is. Let me just give you one practical thing to do every day for the next 30 days, okay? I think this is true. I think what I just told you is true, and I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. And, and I'm going to tell you to do one thing for the next 30 days. You do this one thing for the next 30 days, and I know that something is going to happen for God to show you that all of this is true and to ask you and invite you into the work that God is up to. It's a prayer that I want you to pray. It's in your notes. If you didn't get notes, make sure you get them. Prayer of the Optima Elders. And I'm going to read this, and um, then we're going to have communion together. And what I'd like you to do with communion this morning is just come up and make this deal with God if you want to. If you don't want to, that's okay. Be bored. But this prayer, listen to this. Grant unto me, O Lord, that with peace of mind they may greet all that this new day is to bring. Grant unto me grace to dedicate myself completely to your holy will. For every hour of this day, instruct and prepare me in all things. Whatsoever tidings I may receive during the day, do teach me to accept tranquilly and the firm conviction that all eventualities fulfill your will. Govern my thoughts and feelings in all I do and say. When things unforeseen occur, let me not forget that all comes from you. Teach me to behave sincerely and reasonably toward every member of my family. Now that may be difficult that I may bring them no confusion or sorrow. Bestow upon me, my Lord, strength to endure the fatigue of the day and to bear my part in all of its passing events. And listen to this. I place all of my resources and time at your disposal. I only ask that you make me more aware of the needs at hand and how I can join you in meeting them. Guide thou my will and teach me to pray, to believe, to hope, to suffer, to forgive, to love. Now, here's the deal. Whether you believe anything that I just read is true or not doesn't make any difference to me. What I'm suggesting is that every morning when you get up, you look at that piece of paper and you pray it. And you might say, God, I have no, I have, I don't even believe that you're here. So I don't know who I'm praying this to. But you read through it. And you might say, God, I know that you're here and I don't like you. Just pray it. Every day for 30 days. If you miss a day, it's okay. Pray it every day for 30 days. And I, and I promise at the end of 30 days, something in you will move so that you will experience things that help you understand that there's more to this life than we've ever considered. So God help us with this. We know who, we're knowing and getting to know more about who you are. And I'm grateful that you are this intimate logistics officer who knows what has to happen, who knows who needs what, and I pray, God, that you would help us to make all of our resources available to you. This is new ground for us, Father, for some of us. So I pray that you would help us. So we, we come to communion, and communion is a beautiful thing. It's really just a chance to remember that the one who was most filled with the Spirit, Jesus, um, was this remarkably loved, this man who was incarnated love, and, and you have to understand that it killed him. That's what I'm saying. When you live this way, it's not a guarantee that you're going to have a happily ever after. There's no guarantee of that. But 
there is a guarantee that you will live a life that you will never regret. Jesus hanging on the cross didn't say, damn, I shouldn't have listened. I wish I would have. I should have become a shoemaker and been mi- Now, he died in confusion. My God, my God, why have even you forsaken me? But in trust, into your hands, he says, I commend my spirit. I'm not talking about clarity or ease or I'll know all of the answers. I'm talking about a life like the life that Jesus lived that was beautiful and poured out that made a difference in his culture. That's the idea. And so if that's important to you, my hope is that you'll come and remember his death. The scripture says, in the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he said, this bread I break for you is like my body. Eat it. And then after supper, he took a cup, poured wine into it, and he said, this wine is like the new promise of my blood. And as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death, my kind of death, until it's returned. What kind of death is that? Selfless and sacrificial. And so I invite you to come, and in your coming, spend a moment and make a deal with God about this prayer and see what happens. So come when you're ready. Here's the deal. Uh, You want to turbocharge things? Put who you are and what you have in play. It's the best way. It's the best way to be. It's the best way to live. So God help us. Be generous with all of our gifts, with our work, with who we are, who you're making us be. And I pray, God, that you would help us to become aware of places, of needs, of people. And I pray, God, that you would help others to be aware of our needs. We're grateful that you are this intimate logistics officer. And again, as much as we can. We want to trust you and put what we have in play in that whole big issue. And so help us to pray this prayer. And I ask this in the spirit of Christ, I pray. Amen. Thanks, you guys. Have a great day.